this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. So what's your biggest question when it comes to selling your company? You know, when I ask that question of other entrepreneurs, I hear things like, how do I avoid an earnout? When's the best time to sell? How do I create a bidding war? These questions, along with many others, inspired me to write the book, The Art of Selling Your Business. It's a field guide for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. I've taken all the best practices from the 300 plus interviews I've done for this show and distilled them down into an action plan for you. You can get it along with some gifts from my listeners when you go to builttosell.com slash selling. Coming up next is Cheryl Conti, who built attentively with her partner, Rosalind Lemieux. They were in the business of helping not-for-profit organizations better engage their social media influencers. Cool business, which they sold to BlackBot, a NASDAQ-traded company. This is an interesting story, and it's got lots of layers to it. And I challenge you to think really openly about the topic and some of Cheryl's experiences, which were really challenging for me to hear. A couple of things that I took away from this episode in particular was Cheryl's experience about reducing churn in her software company. Also, how she evaluated M&A professionals. The process may surprise you somewhat. They also did a great job of getting this large NASDAQ-traded listed company to reveal their product roadmap, and Cheryl will explain how she did that. She'll also talk to you about how she walked the fine line between showing them how buying her would make it faster and cheaper for them, but also didn't awaken the giant and create a competitor out of her potential acquire. Lots of great insight here from Cheryl Conti. Enjoy. Cheryl Conti, welcome to Build to Sell Radio. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, attentively. This was a cool company, is a cool company. It still exists, of course. Tell me about what it is. And and, and I'm a, bear with me, I'm a social media neophyte. So you're going to have to explain it to me in easy terms. Explain (laughs) exactly what Attentively does. Sure. Well, I'll give you the tech answer for that. You know, the tech. I'll go over my head. I'll break it down. (laughs) I'm going to break it down, Warlow. Okay. Okay, Thank you. you. And the audience. Okay. For like, what did I tell my mother that we were Mm. doing? Uh, So, uh, you know, Attentively is a uh, social listening, marketing automation, and influencer engagement software as a service. SaaS. For, you know, a, a different way to break that down would be to say, look, you know, on the internet now, there are people who like you, you know, have built uh, big followings and audiences, you know, they have influence. And for the nonprofits, the causes and campaigns with whom we were working, you know, they weren't really sure how to, you know, find those people, how to engage them, how to track you know, those engagements, particularly those who might already be in their audience. One of the things that our tool did was take, you know, big donator, you know, donor lists or big supporter lists of major nonprofits or foundations, match them to social media profiles, and then show them, hey, there are people already who love you. Oh, that's cool. Right. Who, Who can support your work in a much bigger way than just giving you $25. Okay. So, so, the American Red Cross has a you know a, a user base of like a million email addresses, co- you know, contacts that have donated for one reason or the other, and then you can say of these million, there are these like 364 over here that have a big following that are tweeting about you and posting about you all the time, and so you should tap into their you know political capital, if you will, or their 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 influence and and engage them in a more fulsome way. Is that am I getting it? Generally? Yeah, exactly. And then you know it, it did that, but also it it could help you you know just find other people out there, 
who are talking about, you know, your issue or talking about you, um, you know, and, and then help you sort of sort for, okay, where do they live? You know, do they live in a, an important battleground state like Texas, you know, or, you know, Ontario, you know, where do they live, you know, so that we can, you know, engage them so they can get people activated locally. Oh, cool. So now how would this, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm not a huge social media guru by any stretch of the imagination, but I am aware of tools like HubSpot or Hootsuite. And I think there's a bunch of other ones where you can sort of you can kind of manage your social channels. You can see who's you know retweeting your stuff or or liking your stuff. So how would this be say different than some of those platforms? Absolutely, that's a great question. And you're more sophisticated, you know, than you're uh, than you're letting on because most people don't know about those tools. Um, you know, in part, uh, it was uh, our those tools are tailored for businesses small to medium, and in some cases, large enterprise businesses. There was no one creating uh, you know, software like that that was really tailored to the needs of the nonprofit sector, which just in the US alone is an $800 billion you know, a year you know, uh, consumer of goods and services. But they are notoriously cheap, right? Because there's that ratio. I can't remember what the ratio is, but like the number of dollars collected versus the number of dollars put back into the community. It's like the, what is that called? It's like, it's like the efficiency rating of the charity or whatever. It's like, and anything, yeah, it, go ahead. It depends. Yeah. It, it depends on, you know, the, the charity or, you know, the organization, um, but, you know, some of these organizations are, are actually quite large, you know, and they, they do invest, especially these days, you know, in technology that helps them, you know, raise funds, you know, and right. engage, educate, mobilize, et cetera. You know, and so, right, you know, a lot of those um, uh, products also were at a price point that was way far from what, you know, your average nonprofit, even a, you know, a successful large one, you know, could afford. So that was another thing that we did was let's create this software that's tailored for the needs, you know, of the nonprofit sector causes and campaigns, but also at a price point, you know, that they can afford. Can you give me like a, a, a very specific use case where the needs of a not not-for-profit organization would be different than a for-profit organization. Is, can you give me like a really sure. specific use case? I mean, you know, just even simply, you know, uh, so we worked with one organization that was uh, trying to stop um, or at least educate people on genocide in Yemen. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really different from selling bars of soap at Target. You know, it's just a different group of people that you're talking about, a different way of talking about people. You're mobilizing them to take a very different action. You know, conversion means a different thing, you know, in that context than, you know, selling, you know, uh, toothpaste. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So what was the business model? Did, you mentioned it was a SaaS product. So you licensed this software and they paid you kind of on a recurring basis or how, like, what was the billing model? Yeah, it was subscription, uh, generally an annual subscription. Uh, we started and pricing is, you know, as you know, folks know, it can be challenging and it was challenging for us to figure out, you know, what is the pricing model that's going to work, you know, not only for our customers, but also for us, right? Like we need revenue in order, you know, to, to keep people paid. And so you know, we started off, I think, monthly and then six monthly. And then we said, you know, look, we, we need to get people in for a year just so that we have, you know, enough working capital to sustain. And, you know, it actually turned out to be fine. You know, the, you know, asking people to pay for a year wasn't necessarily, it was the same energy, you know, expended to get them to buy for a month. So it, it turned out to be fine. Interesting. How did the annual subscriptions renew? Like what rate of churn did you have in the monthly subscriptions versus the annual subscriptions? Uh, it actually reduced the churn, um, obviously, you know, obviously to go to annual. I mean, of course, we still, you know, uh, were challenged like, you know, any SaaS, you know, to encourage people, you know, to uh, retain. And it, it was an educational sale, you know, in the corporate arena, you know, people have been doing influence and engagement for 10 or 15 years. Believe it or not, it's still somewhat of a novel concept, you know, in the causes and campaign sector. Um, you know, so a lot of times we were educating people on, hey, are you aware that there are influencers? Like, do you know, here's how many people they can reach. You reach this group of people. These people, you can reach 2,000 people with your Twitter account. These people can reach 20 million people. 
these 25 people who already know you and like you, you know, and that, that, you know, really opened people's eyes and, and helped oh, them, yeah. you know, now the retention, you know, it was a challenge, you know, in part for us because, you know, people would get in there, you know, and it was yet another tool, right. That they had to kind of figure out, you know, how to use and integrate into their workflow. Um, so, you know, we definitely invested a lot in customer success, you know, to help people kind of get those first campaigns launch started, you know, see the results. We also had a lot of partnerships with um, major uh, CM, CRMs in our space, uh, customer relationship management uh, software platforms in our space, um, you know, in order to, you know, uh, uh, integrate so that it was easier for folks. They're already using a CRM. This is just another plugin, you know, that enhances that experience. And that was also strategic. You know, we knew that we suspected that it was likely someday that we would get acquired by one of those folks, you know, who just want to take us in house and be exclusive. And so you know, we really worked to build those relationships over time with, with the leading CRMs in our space. How did you think about partnering with those CRMs when presumably given the fact they had developers on staff, they could have built their own tool. Did, did you worry you, there was the kind of fox leading in the hen house or whatever that expression is, is if you kind of partner with them that you run the risk of, of potentially triggering them to build out their own competitive solution? Was that part of your sort of consideration? Uh, sure. Of course, you know, it was something. And, you know, certainly there was one major CRM who, you know, liked what we were doing and actually was run by a friend of mine, which made it even more galling, um, mm -hmm. you know, who, you know, built something not quite like what we had, but saw the concept. But, you know, we, we knew enough about the space to know, look, this is really hard <laughs> to do. Um, you know, most of them don't understand kind of even just the concept of influencer engagement, let alone building a tool. Plus, we also had really great relationships with some of the uh, major social networks like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, you know, that actually helped us grease the wheels, you know, in terms of some of the API calls that we needed to do, which many of them don't have, actually. Interesting. Was there, I mean, it sounds like, a, a, first of all, great execution on your end, but was there anything really proprietary? Like, was there an algorithm or something that would be very difficult to replicate that gave you kind of insulation, competitive insulation from these CRM guys doing it themselves? Was there anything that really made, you know, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I would say, you know, it was, you know, partly all of the different pieces that we put together. Um, plus, again, you know, the, the, you know, a, the relationships that we had with the social networks in order to even be able to access that data, which, again, many of those CRMs, even though they were much, much bigger than us, didn't necessarily have those relationships behind the scenes, you know, mm. to, you know, occasionally we would have issues and we could go directly into contacts of Facebook and say, look, we know you don't usually, you know, allow people to use this kind of API call, but you know what we're trying to do in terms of, saving the world, you know, can you help us out? Is there something you can do? You know, can you talk to somebody? And and they would work it out with us, you know, um, wow. often. I think time, of Facebook so. is this like monolithic organization. Like you actually don't actually talk to anyone. It's just you're like, there's actually nobody who works there, you know, <laughs> like a human being. It's just this <laughs> thing. So like you literally had, you know, an email, like a direct email address of somebody that yeah. you could, you could reach out to and say, Hey, can yeah, you friends, help us out friends of mine. Absolutely. Oh, Friends cool. of mine, you know, who worked internally. And, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, think that way. And yet, you know, I, I live in Silicon Valley, you know, in the Bay Area in the US. And, you know, so I, I know that and I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, your Googles, you know, your Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, etc. are actually um, you know, what people are working on is very diverse and you have all of these little pockets. And, you know, if you can build a relationship, you know, with the right group of people, you know, they're actually great. But the, the challenge is, you know, those people are not accessible, you know, to everyday folk, you know, because, you know, I've been a technologist, you know, for a really long time, you know, and, you know, sort of got involved with some of these social networks even before it was cool, uh, you know, I was able to build relationships early, you know, not everyone is able to do that. That said, you know, if you go to the right, you know, conferences or events, you know, if you, you know, figure out the right networking, yeah, there's lots of human beings, you know, who work there, you know, who actually do want, you know, people to be successful, you know, in using their tools. 
that's super helpful. Just making a note here. So <clears throat> tell me about your partner. Uh, I believe her name was Rosalind Lemieux. I mean, how did you guys meet? How did you divvy up responsibilities, divvy up equity? Like, how did this all kind of come, to, uh, come, come together? Oh, that's a good question. Well, you know, Roz and I, uh, you know, I was living at, in DC at the time, and so was she. And so we were part of this kind of, you know, internet political mafia of, you know, you know, early people, you know, who were really interested and saw the value of nonprofit plus technology, which used to be a very small group of people. Now, of course, you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in that. Thank goodness. Um, you know, but back in the day, that was a, actually a relatively small cohort of folks. You know, so a lot of us knew each other. Um, and I remember, you know, going to uh, her organization uh, had this big, you know, party in DC and, you know, seeing her in a white leather jacket, you know, talking to the crowd. And I was like, she seems cool. Um, and, uh, you know, long story short, you know, I had been recruited out here to a large uh, PR company, um, you know, to restart uh, kind of, you know, put the paddles on uh, their um, digital uh, campaign, you know, their digital presence. And, you know, it didn't work out. You know, they, they just weren't serious about it. You know, I was working like literally 19 hour days, you know, and I, you know, even created towards the end of that, like, you know, a plan, like, you know, a mini business plan of like, look, if you give me, you know, the following staff, you know, and the following resources, I can bring in a million dollars of revenue by the end of that year. They thought that was hilarious. Uh, you know, I had, a, you know, a promotion built in for, with good prom performance into my offer letter. I didn't get that. Um, you know, uh, but by then my, the people who had recruited me had, a, had actually left. So I said, look, you know, if you're not going to promote me and if you're not actually going to support this work, I'm going to go like, I, you know, I could see why they had imported me from DC because here in the Bay area, there's lots of great jobs. There's lots of, you know, amazing things to get involved in and like working, you know, you know, running the digital arm of a, you know, PR firm is like one of the least glamorous things you can do here. Okay. So I was like, yo, you know, like I'm out. Uh, so quit, quit that day. Um, the next day, uh, put out a message on Twitter that said, Hey, I find myself available. Who wants to work with me? Um, and, you know, the power of a network I actually got a lot of incoming from that, you know, including, you know, the, uh, you know, someone close to Roz who said, hey, you know, I feel like you two should work together. I feel like that would be a kind of an interesting combination. And, you know, we actually started working on a project together. And the magical moment for me was when I was describing a thing that we should do and build. And by the time I had finished talking, she had actually created it. I was like, oh, oh, it's on. Let's do what, this, baby. When you say she had created, you mean she had created in her mind? She had. She no, had... like physically, she had created a spreadsheet, you know, with a pivot table, like literally like she had built it. The wow. system that I was describing. Yes, it was magical, John. I was like, we are going to conquer the world. Let's get let's get so, let's get this going. Um, so and by the you... end of the year, by the, let me finish my story. By the end yeah. of that year, John, you know, after when and, you know, when we started, I said, look, I have ten thousand dollars in the bank. Okay, that's it. Black and poor. Okay, like if we don't have clients by the end of this month, I'm going to have to get a job at a job. And she had about ten or twenty thousand dollars herself. By the end of that year, we had uh, ten employees, and we had created that million dollars of revenue. That's incredible. So, you each kicked in money, or how did how did you divvy up the equity? Like, was there cash that you each put in, or what was that? What was that like? You know, it was very much eat what you kill, you know, especially in those early days of like, okay, we've got a client, you know, uh, we were always 50 50, you know, we, we, we always kept things, you know, even split, um, you know, just seeing each other as peers and supporting each other. Um, Did and, you have a shotgun uh, agreement? Uh, like where if one of you wanted out, you could pay, buy each other out? Was, was there any sort of legal contract? You know, that's interesting. Not really. I mean, we never even imagined. I mean, we were so like yin and yang, you know, that I think we both understood that like without each other, like this wasn't 
probably going to work that hmm. like, you know, we just, you know, in to quote the movie, we completed each other. Um, so yeah, I mean, if something had come to that, I think, you know, there's probably something in the bylaws, but really, you know, I think we understood that, you know, this is the team that we are an ecosystem together. Got it. How did you make it a team beyond just the, the, the kind of Roz and Cheryl show. So like you guys started it, but you built it to be 10 employees within the first year. So how did you make that leap? Cause I think a lot of listeners are listening saying, I still get asked by customers to be involved. Like I still get clients who want me to personally, you know, oversee their project or whatever. How did you make the leap from the, the kind of Roz and Cheryl show to, to employees who are doing some of the work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting to think back on that. You know, I think especially in the tech world, you know, certainly people, you know, understand that, you know, the there's sort of the people, you know, who have the ideas, you know, who have, you know, the education, you know, who have the relationships, you know, and then there are the people who, you know, code, you know, or, you know, create the email, you know, and they're doing it, you know, it's a very collaborative, you know, and creative in a lot of ways pursuit. So I think, you know, from that standpoint, you know, I think people understood that, hey, you know, you want to build a website, you know, we're going to help you, you know, with the process, but we're not going to do every single part of this. You know, there's there's a whole group of people together, your team and our team together, you know, that's going to make this work or the same with a campaign, you know, depending on the size of the campaign, you know, it was clear that Roz and I personally could not do all of the things, which is not humanly possible, you know, for us to build, you know, 20 different emails, you know, that go out, you know, at midnight, like it just wasn't going to happen. And so, you know, I think managing that expectation, you know, with the clients that, you know, I'm here with you, you know, I'm intaking with you, you know, and diagnosing with you what you need, what your challenges are, you know, I'm going to create solutions, and then I'm going to inspire this amazing team working with you to actually build that solution and, you know, win the day. Yeah. So it's interesting. Like I think six weeks ago, I interviewed uh, another social media agency owner. Her name was Jody Cook. She's based in the UK. And one of the things that she did to get out or to sell was to document her standard operating procedures, her kind of processes she wanted employees to follow. So was that something that you guys focused on as well? Like actually putting in writing or video, what, how you wanted campaigns to be executed? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, documentation, you know, again, for technologists is just something that we naturally do um, if you're doing it right. Uh, so certainly documented, but also we invested in training our team. Mm. You know, a lot of what we did, you know, if we had a retreat, you know, probably half of that retreat was just, you know, sharing skills, uh, you know, training each other, you know, talking not just about the nuts and bolts, but the philosophy, you know, and a lot of what we, you know, focus on and what I focus on, you know, today, you know, with my firm Do Big Things is creating that culture of collaboration and support and trust where you don't have to have all the answers. You know, you can tap into other people's knowledge, you know, and, and together synthesizing that is what's going to create the magic. That makes sense. How big did you get this company before you sold it? Like how, how, either revenue or number of employees or what was, how big was it when you decided to sell? Yeah. So, you know, number of employees, you know, we always tried to say, stay nimble, you know, and, and uh, strong. So we probably had no more than 12 um, mm-hmm. employees, but certainly, you know, our revenue, you know, was, was quite a bit more than that, you know, annually. Yep. And how did, what triggered you to want to sell? Was there some sort of straw that provoked, you know, proverbial, you know, the proverbial back of the, uh, the camel, so to speak? Well, it was more of a convergence of forces, John. So uh, we were at a point where, you know, we had kind of run out of runway or, you know, we could see where, you know, runway was going to end, you know, compared to revenues. Um, And, you know, and, and just to be clear, you know, a lot of software startups, it's pretty normal for them to be, you know, in the red, you know, operating in the red, because people understand that, you know, you're bringing in revenues, but it takes, it takes capital to actually build the product, to build the systems. Like it's, it's literally a physical thing behind the scenes. Um, So, you know, we were, we were, you know, forecasting the end of our runway and saying, huh, you know, we could raise another round, you know, we'd already had a series A, you know, we could, we could do another bridge, 
loan or a convertible note or whatever, or, you know, this is an inflection moment at which we could sell, you know, it takes about the same amount of time and effort. Um, and, you know, looking around, you know, some other folks were starting to exit in our space. Uh, we um, could see that things were changing, you know, with the social networks, you know, there were a lot of a lot, this was even before um, GBTR, GBDR, you know, in the EU regulations around privacy, you know, even before that, you know, we could see that uh, the social networks were starting to clamp down on what kinds of information you could get about individual users. And so, you know, the, you know, the convergence of those factors said, you know, this, this software is going to work better inside a CRM, you know, where they're going to have a little more access, you know, to people's individual information. Uh, so it just seemed like the right time, you know, just bringing all of that together. And I think it's easy to miss that inflection point. You know, I think so many folks, you know, just want to, you know, you know, they they keep the the hustle and the grind. You know, they get addicted to that. You know, they don't. You know, they're they're in denial. You know, about the market forces that are happening outside, and they're just sort of hoping, you know, that maybe it'll work out. But you know, I think we really tried to, you know, keep a as cold and objective an eye as possible in thinking about, you know, but beyond our feelings, you know, about our baby, you know, what's best, you know, for the company and for our team. Got it. So if I'm understanding correctly, the, the, the convergence of, of forces was number one, running, like you're running out of cash, you would have had to raise more money to continue the growth. Uh, number two, you know, legislation in Europe, GDPR, was sort of a canary in the coal mine to say that you know that this whole privacy thing is going to become even bigger deal. And then, in addition to that, a lot of the social media platforms were starting to clamp down, and so those three things were starting to like the writing was on the wall, so to speak, that this would be better yeah. in a CRM. Absolutely, but you know the writing was on the wall. We had really strong relationships, you know, and. Uh, you know, again, there was an energy in the space, right? There was, it was clear that, you know, there were people looking at our space, you know, some other folks were getting acquired or, you know, getting private equity deals. And we're like, okay, you know, this seems like a good moment, right? A rich moment in which to, to strike. And so what did you do next? Well, we started asking around, uh, you know, I'm very much a believer in the power of relationships. And so we started asking some of those friends like, okay, so who did you, talk to, you know, how did this work for you? We got a little more educated in the process, but also uh, we um, started to then talk to merger and acquisitions lawyers. You know, we started talking to some bankers and, and basically interviewing them, which was a very interesting process. You know, we were, even though we were not necessarily the, the biggest, um, you know, uh, startup in, in our space, you know, because of who we were, you know, we were, you know, both, you know, female, technologists, you know, a black female, you know, um, founder on board, we were highly visible. Everybody was watching us. Um, and, you know, we, it was definitely difficult to fundraise in the early days. I mean, you know, it was, uh, I actually now advise, you know, um, a major uh, fund that invests in female startups. And they told me, you know, look, you know, we worked really, really hard to weed out as much of the bias in our process as possible. Um, but, and we did a pretty good job in terms of getting, you know, black and brown female founders, you know, through our system and in front of angels. But what we found, the problem was getting angels to write the checks. There's mm. a lot of like talk and not a lot of check writing. And their average was, you know, it takes us about seven introductions to angels to get a white female startup founder funding. It takes on average 50, five zero introductions. Mm to get a similar black or brown female funded. And that definitely rang true for me. You know, I probably had to knock on, you know, at least that many doors, you know, to get our initial funding in. To raise your um, series A? To, uh, no, to raise our seed, to raise our, you know, the, that first, those first couple of checks were very, very difficult. It does get easier or at least slightly easier, you know, um, over time uh, to raise because, you know, ideally you have some traction, you have some stuff, you know, other people have given you money. And so that's reassuring, uh, you know, to angels or, or VCs, but, you know, it was, a, it, you know, it was a little bit of a deja vu. Then when we got to the M&A process, you know, talking to these folks who, you know, we were going to be their clients. Right. Like we were hiring mm -hmm. them, you know, and, and really running up against, you know, some some real racism and sexism, you know, just in kind of their approach to talking to us. 
you know, so that became, you know, to a certain extent, a, a filter of like, you know, because, well, here, I'll, I'll just, you know, when you're bringing on an m a person, they're going to have conversations, you know, with acquirers where you're not in the room. And so they have to kind of get you, they have to represent you, they have to almost be you in that space you know, in order to help, you know, move the deal along. And so we really wanted to find that right match and it wasn't easy. So what was it that signified to you that this was not going to be a fit? Like what was it that, what, what did they say or do or, you know, act? How do they act that, that would indicate to you this, this M&A professional that was going to take you to market was just not a good fit? Can you give me like a sort of tangible example? Yeah, it's hard, you know, because microaggressions, they're called micro for a reason, right? You know, they're, it's yeah. so subtle and, you know, no one's, no one's going to come out, you know, and call you the N word, you know, these days, you know, they're just going to be really condescending, you know, or dismissive or, you know, um, diminishing, you know, of your performance, um, you know, so we got a, a sum of that, you know, going on, um, you know, we got people who, you know, felt some sort of need to flex in front of us, uh, like, you know, kind of trying to convince us how big and bad they were rather than really trying to get, you know, who we were and, and the types of people we were trying to sell to um, our customers, but also, you know, ideal acquirers. Um, yeah, it was a really strange, you know, process, you know, of, of folks who, you know, undervalued, you know, what we were bringing to the table, or, you know, even as they were trying to pitch us, you know, kind of put us down in a way, and were mm -hmm. condescending. So how did you find someone that did get you in the end? <laughs> uh, you know, interesting enough, we uh, had pitched um, Venture uh, Atlanta, which is this big um, conference and, and organization that's kind of a kind of a, a clearinghouse for, you know, the, the venture capital and, and uh, angel uh, scene, you know, in Atlanta. Um, so we had actually uh, pitched in front of 600 people, uh, you know, at the time. But, you know, while I was there, I actually went to some other sessions and I ended up going to this really great, uh, you know, seminar um, that one of the panelists was Trisha Salonero of Woodbridge Capital. And I just remember, you know, just the way that she talked about, um, you know, uh, m and you know, the way that she talked about, you know, supporting startups and founders. I just really dug her, you know, just her vibe as a person. And I'm very much, you know, a woo-woo intuition <laughs> instinct vibe person. That's me. My business partner was not, but I brought that to the table. And you know what? John, neuroscience tells us now, contemporary the neuroscience woo is a thing. that your, you know, that your brain basically can synthesize literally millions of data inputs, right? And it synthesizes that and, and kind of cranks it in a black box. And the output literally is that gut instinct, you know, that intuition, that hunch, like it's literally the smartest part of you from an older part of your brain trying to tell you something. Interesting. So I, I, you know, I really work with that. Like that is a pretty important, you know, sort of navigating tool for me, even in business. And so, you know, I reached out to her and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I, we met a couple of years ago. You might not remember, you know, Adventure Atlanta, you know, here's where we are, you know, would you like to talk? And yeah, you know, she was great. And she totally got us. And she was like, you know, really outlined the process, took us seriously, treated us like people, uh, you know, who were, who were smart. Uh, and yeah, you know, from there, you know, we were able to, to negotiate a, 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 you know, a decent exit. Got it. So Trisha is an M&A professional. Is that her, like that's yeah, her by, yeah. by training? That's what she does. Yeah. She is a, she is a leader of her, of her organization, uh, which does M&A. Okay. So she, you engage her and she shops the deal, presumably. Did you go through the whole process of creating a a sim or like a, a deck that would describe the company and the whole thing. She pitched it. Did how many sort of, first of all, let me ask you a different question. I'm assuming the primary target for Trisha were these CRM companies that had the specialty and not for profits. Was that her main? Through? You know, interestingly enough, you know, just cause she's a, she's a pro, you know, she had this complex matrix of here are hmm. all of these different sectors and different kinds of, companies that might be interested in this. 
um, you know, obviously we had these relationships and, you know, we sense that probably it might be that that one's one of those might be our best shot, but we actually ended up, you know, she really broadened, you know, the, the number of people just because of her greater knowledge of the space. And that's also a thing that you want to look for, you know, in your m a professional, they too are powered by relationships. Okay, and the, the quality and extent of their relationships and who they're able to talk to within companies is going to, you know, in some cases, make or break your deal. And so, uh, you know, working with her, we, you know, we were able to, yeah, talk to uh, some different people that we probably wouldn't have even known about, um, you know, and some of those uh, conversations got serious. But in the end, you know, it was, uh, you know, a one of our strategic partners um, and probably not necessarily the strategic partner with whom we had, you know, the strongest relationship. I mean, we had a good relationship, but like in contrast, MailChimp in our early days had given us just like $15,000, no questions asked to just help build, you know, our API into their system. Like, you know, it was so crazy. Um, but, you know, BlackBot, you know, sort of got it. And, uh, you know, they, you know, it was interesting because there was literally a hole in their roadmap that attentively you know, fit right into, you know, and right, they had that build or buy decision. I think we were, you know, made a compelling case for it's going to cost you more to build this than it would to just buy it and just, you know, get going. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. persuasive thing for them was that, you know, in learning and working with us, and again, you know, this is, this is part of how, you know, often acquisitions happen, you know, you get to know each other. And one of the things that one of the things that they observed in working with us was that about a third of our clients and customers were actually also BlackBod customers, right? And so they're like, you know, there's something here, there, like our customers seem to want this. We have an even stronger sales engine than these guys do. You know, we think we can actually do pretty well, you know, if we just kind of bring this in. That's interesting. Did did you guys have any sense of what you thought the company might be worth before you met with Trisha? Like, did you have a, I mean, you, you had raised funding, so you sort of had a sense of what it was pre, you know. Yeah, we had a valuation, you know, we had a sense of, you know, what would, you know, make our investors whole, you know, and, and feel good to them, you know, what would give us you know, some, you know, make it feel like, you know, we were getting a return on our investment, you know, in building the company. Yeah, we, we had a number in mind for sure. And, you know, we got pretty close to that number. Um, and look, you know, for most acquirers, you know, they are looking to acquire tech, talent, or revenue. And if you've got two of those things, you know, you've got something to sell. You know, in our case, we may not have had, obviously, the revenue, per se, but we had an amazing tech team and, and technology. Uh, you know, we had an amazing team, you know, that was Cracker Jack. Um, and we had, you know, really great technology, you know, to offer. So that was, you know, the thing that we were selling. But you had revenue, right? It wasn't like you were pre-money, right? You had revenue. No, it we just had wasn't, revenue. It wasn't yeah, like but, massive revenue or whatever. Yeah. I mean, if someone's buying you for the revenue, like you're just like making money hand over fist, right? Like it's just pouring in like by the bucket loads and they're like, great, we can add this to our bottom line. Some companies are like that. You know, a lot of times those are, you know, some kind of product that people just love and is cheap to make and, you know, make, you know, it's being sold for a lot. Um, you know, or it's a SaaS product that again is, you know, kind of like plug and play. It just, you know, people just, you know, buy it and, you know, there's not much. So those do exist, you know, but I would say, you know, it's more often that, you know, people are selling their team, um, which as you know, software developers, engineers, you know, are hard to find sure. um, or they're, and, or they're selling the tech. Yeah. And so in your case, did you have a sense, I mean, if we, if we avoid talking about the revenue itself, because I think we haven't said that publicly, did you get a sense of, of, of what you were hoping to get as a multiple of revenue? Like, were you, did you have like a, a I want to get a two X or three X or four, like what did, what was your sort oh, yeah. of aspiration? Yeah. You know, I'm not the numbers person. So, you know, I don't remember all of the, all of the specific numbers, John. Uh, but yeah, we had a sense of like, look, you know, if, if we're doing, you know, 10 X revenues, you know, this would be a good deal, you know, and, 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 you know, but I would say, you know, for us, you know, at the point at which we were selling, we were really geared towards, you know, what are our debts? You know, what, what are, where are we with our investors? You know, what have people put in, you know, and what do we want, you know, what would be, you know, a good, a good story for them to tell. 
Um, you know, and then, you know, what's left over for us, you know, and, and are we going to feel good about that? Right. And I should have asked earlier, but the, the people who invested in your series A, were th- was this sort of, uh, was this institutional money like VCs or were more kind of friends and close family? Like what was, who, I guess, and I'll give you, I'll tell you why I'm asking. I'm assuming that if it was sort of institutional VC money, they would be looking for that sort of unicorn exit and probably would have wanted you to hold for longer and sell for more. Uh, that's why I'm asking, who was the, who was in that sort of series A that wrote the, the initial checks? Sure. Well, we relied mostly on angels. And I think, you know, this is something in which, you know, in building the new economy, you know, in this new era in which I think we're all, we all sense that we're living in, you know, the concept that you have, you know, quote, friends and family who can give you hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, look, as a black technologist, I make the most in my family or, you know, close to it. One of my uncles is an orthopedic surgeon. He's probably, you know, a little ahead of me. Like if I had gone to my family, you know, mostly back in Baltimore and said, hey, I've got this marketing automation startup, (laughs) you know, it's it's software as a service. It's pretty high tech. You know, we think we're going to do. Here's what would have happened, John. A bunch of people in Baltimore would have owed me $20. Okay, so like the, the whole concept of friends and family is something that we just have to take off the table if we're going to democratize, you know, access and, and bring in more great ideas. Because, you know, there are great ideas out there that aren't necessarily surrounded, you know, with people, you know, who have like extra money left over in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, to get that off the ground. And, you know, and so investing in that pre-seed, you know, and seed stage, you know, is really going to help, you know, every economy grow. So in your case, it was angel investors. Did you, how did you find those angels? Uh, A lot of it was networking. You know, a lot Mm -hmm. of it, some of it was research, you know, using the internet to figure out, okay, you know, who's interested in in this kind of, you know, software, you know, and have they invested in it before? Um, But a lot of it was, you know, just, you know, gumshoe, you know, person on the street, you know, talking to, you know, saying, Hey, do you know, do you know anybody, you know, who'd be interested in this and, you know, getting some introductions and then talking to that person. But as I said, you know, I actually had to talk to a lot of people. And at the time, you know, we were running a multi-million dollar revenue company, you know, on the side, a different company. We had two companies at the time, you know, I had, you know, some notoriety, you know, I had, I had run a, you know, pretty uh, popular um, blog you know, like an A-list political blog, you know, I'd been on TV, I'd been profiled in newspapers, like I knew, I knew a lot of people, people, a lot of people knew me, I was used to getting my calls answered, and, you know, emails replied to, and, you know, it was very difficult, I mean, it, it it was tough, and it, it took a long time, it took, you know, I, I usually say, you know, the conventional wisdom is it takes six to 12 months, you know, to raise, you know, around, no matter where you're starting out. And, you know, if you are, you know, what we now call an excluded entrepreneur, it, it's, it might take you longer. That said, you know, this was over 10 years ago, you know, that we were, you know, getting started. I will say things are much, much better, you know, than they used to be. Um, you know, but the fact that, you know, my tech startup attentively was the first, as far as we know, with a Black female founder on board in the U.S., to be acquired by a NASDAQ traded company. And that happened in 2016. That's not great, folks. Like that, we're not doing great in terms of, you know, making sure that, you know, the cream is rising to the top and getting the support that it needs, you know, to really perform. Because here's what we know now, John, every study out there, and I challenge you to find one that that doesn't say this. Every study says that diverse led firms are more innovative, they are more productive, they are more profitable. So if all you care about is money, the only thing you want to do is make the most money. If you want ROI, you need DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. How important was it that you have a win Because you're clearly a leader in this space and you represent a lot of people that didn't get the VC round. They didn't get the angel money. They don't have the friends and family around. And and you, by sheer tenacity and, and, and a lot of skill, were able to. Did you feel a sense of, um, like, I got to get this right because I'm, there's a lot of people that I'm standing on the shoulders of. 
Does, oh, you know there what, was huge I'm pressure. Getting... Absolutely. No, I think you're, you're reading me loud and clear, John, that, you know, we were incredibly visible in the space. Um, you know, and we hadn't really thought about it, you know, when we started the company, you know, you know, we had, a, you know, obviously a, a lot of friends, you know, again, we were part of a community, you know, and it's only when we looked back that, you know, the other folks who were, st you know, creating startups, you know, that that met a need, you know, in the, you know, nonprofit tech arena, you know, most of those were white guys, you know, and it was like way easier for them to, to not only get money, but get more money. Um, than us. Do you know, know, and, though? Here, uh, let me challenge, let me challenge you. Cause yeah. I mean, I've had lots of white guys on the show <laughs> who said, man, like raising money was tough. Raising money was tough. I got no, a lot. I went to M and a folks who said, I won't touch it unless it's worth 10 million bucks. Like there are a lot of people who would challenge that idea that quote, raising money is easy. So how do well, you yes. know, had like, We've all got our lived experience. I've never raised money. So it's like, you know, like I'm, 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 I'm trying to imagine I'm sort of advocating for them as listeners right now and saying, but wait a minute, it was really hard for me too. Like, how do you know? It's just the, it's not just the nature of the beast, so to speak. Sure. Um, you know, there's a few reasons. I mean, we know just looking at the numbers. Okay. Like if you look at the amount of money that uh, in terms of venture capital of any kind, that goes to female founders, you know, of any shade, it's still in the three to 4%, which is insane, given that women buy 75 to 85% of everything. <laughs> so like, it would seem to make sense that if you, you know, want to sell something that you actually have the perspective of the people that you're trying to sell to on board, right? Like, you know, this, this, this isn't rocket science, folks. Um, and then for, you know, money to Black women, again, it's much better than it used to be, but it's still statistically zero, okay, in the context of all of that money, okay? And it's not because, I mean, like, you know, it's not because we're not hard workers, okay? We're, you know, you can see, you can see Black and brown people working real hard wherever you go, okay? It's not that we're not smart. It's not that we're hard workers. You know, we just don't always get the same chances. Now, I will say, and, and I have heard this before, John, and I should probably change the way I talk about it, because I think a lot of yeah, white men, you know, legitimately say, look, it wasn't easy for me. Like this was this was actually really hard. And yeah. I believe you, you know, no startup, no matter who you are, startups are really, really hard. And in the U.S., you know, 90 percent of startups fail in their first year. I mean, it is really, you know, a tough act to pull off. So it would, you know, imagine, you know, you're listening and you're like, oh man, you know, I was sweating bullets. I was crawling on my knees. You know, I got turned down a lot. Like it was tough. Imagine that, but 10 times harder and, and 10 times less money. And so let's, I want to go back to my original question, because I think that provides great context. You raised some money from these angels and you said when you're putting a value on the company part of your calculus was I've got some debt I want to pay off. I want, you know, blah, blah, blah. But part of the calculus was I want to get a return for those people who believed in me, who, who, who invested. What kind of return were you hoping to deliver to them? Like if they put in a dollar, were you hoping to give them $2 back, $5 back, $10 back? Like what was the ROI that you, that you were trying to aspire to give them? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, we were we were hoping to do something like two to five X, you know, their original Done. investment, you know, particularly those early investors, right? You know, who had, you know, really believed in us. And, you know, that was really important to us. And, you know, I think we did well for them. And part of it, again, you know, because we were so visible in the space and because we were really early in terms of founders in our space who looked like us, right? And we're delivering a, you know, a quality product. Um, you know, we wanted to encourage, we wanted to be a success story that encouraged more people, you know, to quote, take a risk. You know, I think that, you know, um, you know, black and brown founders, female founders, people think that investing them is risky, you know, that it's higher risk. It's actually lower risk. If, if you actually look at the numbers of like success rates of those, you know, companies and, you know, efficient use of capital, they're actually lower risk. Hmm. You know, and so we wanted to be that story and be able to, you know, do what I'm doing now and talk to John Marlow of Phil Pizzell about like yeah. this amazing success story, you know, and you encourage other to be people to open their mind. Yeah, yeah you wanted to be to open the, the mind. Yeah, I get it. I get it for yeah. sure. So you thought a two to five X would have been 
a success for your investors and allow you to play that role of uh, advocate and success story. Um, I want to go back to Blackbaud because the uh, the the ultimate acquirer is a Nasdaq uh, New York, uh, Nasdaq listed company called Blackbaud, which has it does a lot of work in not for profit. I mean that's that that is their space, right? Uh, can you describe them in in a nutshell for people who don't know that name? Absolutely. So Blackbaud is one of the biggest uh, purveyors of nonprofit software, and you know nonprofit. Broadly speaking, you know, you're talking uh, faith organizations, you know, like major faith to smaller faith organizations, uh, education, K through 12, but also higher education, um, you know, advocacy organizations, you know, all, any kind of organization you can think of, you know, that has a, a purpose, you know, that that is a nonprofit, you know, that is seeking to make the world a little less terrible in some Got way. it. So, so CRM, they would have CRM as one of their core uh, offerings in addition to billing platforms, I'm assuming, and other Oh, multiple types kinds of, of CRMs, multiple types of, you know, because depending on, you know, the, you know, the sector within that, you know, with the, the, the micro sectors, you know, different, you know, if faith organizations need something different than higher ed. Right. Sure. So, you know, yeah, they have multiple, that said, you know, yeah, they have, you know, their flagship products, um, you know, that are, you know, applicable to any nonprofit, you know, and, and that they build, you know, they, they build modules on depending on, you know, what you need. And you mentioned that they had in their product roadmap, which is kind of technology speak for their future plans of things they want to let, you know, release. They had something similar to attentively on their product roadmap. Yeah, they absolutely there. did. Yeah, we 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 talked, you know, at length. I mean, they literally showed us the roadmap, and they were like, "This, like, this is you guys." <laughs> had, like, like this is the thing, and you have the thing that we uh, we actually want to build. I mean, that's the ideal one of the ideal scenarios, right? Yeah, for sure. And I want to dig in here because here's here, first of all, I want to know how did you get that out of them because that would seem to me, to be, to put them in a very vulnerable position, to be as transparent with you that like, it's on our product roadmap. And, and like, I could imagine both you and Rosalind kind of, <laughs> you know. Oh, absolutely. You're like, yes. Thinking, yes, this sounds good. So how did you get them to tell you that? You know, they, they, to a certain extent, volunteered the information, but, you know, and that was, that wasn't one of the early conversations. We were certainly a little further along, you know, in the, like, the, you know, what in the software game they call deepening the relationship, uh, you know, so we, we were a little far along, but yeah, I mean, we, we asked them also straight up, like, you know, because every company has a roadmap in every big company, you know, and that roadmap is usually, you know, fairly complex and sophisticated. It can go out as long as, you know, five years, you know, or more. I mean, Facebook basically has a 10 year roadmap, you know, so yeah, I think we, you but know, they're not in the habit out. of sharing that with people outside their company, right? Like you guys obviously did a great job of somehow lulling them into a sense, like they shared that with you, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you know, again, you know, I'm very much a, you know, a believer in the power of relationships. And, you know, I think that, I think that people often, believe that, you know, an acquisition is just like faceless company, you know, gobbling up, you know, a tiny company. And that's generally not how it works. You know, the, the, the fastest, you know, more, most certain way, you know, to get acquired, you know, is to build that relationship. So another example would be CrowdTangle. So CrowdTangle, um, we uh, were early on in working with the founders, you know, of uh, CrowdTangle, and, I have no idea uh, what tra- crowd tangle is. Oh, so crowd tangle, crowd tangle is a uh, software. Um, it's actually now part of Facebook's journalism project. Okay. Um, but basically it is software that analyzes uh, social media activity, you know, and figures out, you know, who are the biggest influencers, you know, within and, and, you know, how is that moving over time? Sounds right? like a competitor to attentively. Uh, not exactly. No, they were they were doing a, a different thing. But, you know, we were, you know, we were connected in that in that we actually helped to build some of the early software. And and through that um, sweat equity, you know, we were minority minority shareholders, you hmm. know, in, in that deal. And, uh, you know, the the founders, um, you know, they, they saw our exit and we actually ended up advising them a little bit 
you know, behind the scenes, you know, Brandon Silverman, you know, is still, you know, there. And, you know, what they were telling me was, you know, we have this great relationship with Facebook because otherwise they, they wouldn't, again, have been able to have software that did what it did. We have this great relationship and they they keep, you know, trying to have this conversation with us. And I was like, yeah, I think they're trying to buy you. Like, I think that they're like... <laughs> I think what they're trying to say is that they want, you know, and so sometimes it happens like that, where, you know, you have this strong relationship and they approach you, you know, oftentimes that conversation is subtle at first, you know, they're kind of feeling you out, sure. um, you know, cause they don't want to damage the relationship in any way or spook you or, you know, get you thinking about going to somebody else. But, you know, um, you know, they ended up, you know, that's, they ended up having, you know, a successful transaction in which, you know, I also participated, um, you know, via that, um, so, you know, there's lots of different ways, but relationships are really important. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, we had already invested in building relationships, you know, within BlackBot. And then once we started, uh, you know, the process of, you know, getting serious with them, you know, working on those relationships with the, with the new people that we were talking to was also a high priority in gaining their trust, you know, and, but also, uh, you know, encouraging, you know, figuring out if we could trust them. What was Trisha's reaction when BlackBot said that your product is in their, or something like your product is in their product roadmap? What did Trisha, how did Trisha react to that information? It was good news. <laughs> it was good news for Trisha. I mean, it gave us a, you know, a, a point, you know, it, it just reinforced our argument that, look, it's going to cost you more to build this than buy it. Like, here's That's where it is in your roadmap you know, and you can buy this today. Like you can spend three years, you know, and a whole bunch of money and developer time, you know, and, and product manager time trying to build this thing without the relationships that we have, you know, with these social media platforms, or you could just buy us. Like you could just buy it and have it and then, you know, start selling tomorrow. And so you made the case that it would take longer did you also make the case, you, you said that, I, I wrote down the words, whole bunch of money. Did you quantify for them what it would cost to write the number of lines of code that it would yeah, take to, a certain to extent. replicate? You quantified yeah, that? Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, we certainly talked numbers and said, look, you know, here's, here's how long it took us to build it. <laughs> right. Like, so you said it cost us X took. amount. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It cost us X amount, you know, and we have relationships that you don't have. Okay. That makes this thing that powers this thing, you know, it's going to take you a, a lot more time, you know, but, you know, the reason why, you know, large companies ac acquire smaller companies is that by the time you're a certain size, it's just hard to get things done quickly. Like, I love this idea of, the build versus buy. Cause I think that's a conversation that happens. Usually the owner, the seller of the company is not in the room when the acquirer sort of closes the door and says, okay, should we just buy these folks or should we, uh, you know, compete with them? And I think the other side of this is that sometimes big companies, NASDAQ traded multi-billion, you know, the big, you know, companies like Blackbaud may, may use that tactic as a threat. In other words, they might say, look, your product is in our product roadmap. Um, and maybe they don't come out and say it, but the implication is like, if you don't sell to us, we're going to compete with you head on and put you out of business. That's another sort of heavy handed way that sometimes acquirers would sort of quote unquote, threaten you and therefore try to get you to lower your expectations. Did you get any sense of that from them? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, because they are making that decision in real time. I mean, that really is the decision. And, you know, you've really got to get down to brass tacks when you're talking about, you know, millions of dollars of money mm -hmm. changing hands. So absolutely, you know, they, you know, they didn't necessarily threaten us with like, hey, we're going to build this and compete with you. Like, Although that does happen, um, you know, when you look at uh, Snapchat, right? Instagram, uh, Instagram slash Facebook tried really hard, very hard to buy Snapchat and they just wouldn't sell. 
So they're like, okay, well, we're just going to have to supersize Instagram and change some of how that works to compete with Snapchat. And they did very successfully. But did you, did you and Roz and Trisha have conversations that like, <clears throat> meaning, you know, w- we need to be careful not to push these folks too hard because the last thing we want to do is end up competing with BlackBot. Like, did that conversation happen behind closed doors with your team? Not really. I mean, we knew enough about the challenge of building the product that we were like, there's no way. Hmm. Like, there's no way that they're going to like, you know, it's a fantasy that they, if they think that they're going to build this. And compete with Why? Them, like, this, not, these, guys are a, these guys are a massive NASDAQ traded company. Why were you so confident that they would not be able to replicate what you had created? Like what? That's really interesting to me. Why were you so confident? Because it takes time to build software and internally in a large organization, it just takes forever, you know, to, to get things approved, to move things through the pipeline. It takes a lot more people. They just can't move as fast. Um, you know, there's people checking every dollar that you're spending and that's saying, well, you know, the legal people are like, well, why are you spending it this way? Right? Like, we didn't have to deal with any of that. Plus, again, you know, we had relationships, you know, with software. Uh, with the the social networks that they didn't really have, you know, and that, which had been really key to our success. And so, but part how, of what we were selling were those relationships. Yeah, but but you were leaving. So how would how did they ensure they would monetize those relationships when you were you were kind of leaving the company when you sold it? Like, what what efforts did they make to ensure that 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 relationship equity kind of accrued to them? Well, generally speaking, you know, almost always, uh, you know, an acquirer wants to bring you on board. Sure. Right. And it definitely was a little bit of a point of contention because I didn't want to go inside. I like to be free to roam. Um, Why does that that, surprise me? (laughs) uh, But, you know, they, you know, in my case, we worked out, (coughs) we worked out a strategic uh, partnership, basically a strategic retainer, for about I think a couple years. Okay. So that helped you know bridge that gap, but you know the rest of the team also had some of these relationships, so they went in internally and you know really helped to cross pollinate you know some of our ideas and energy, and that's often what acquirers are looking for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. If you could roll back the clock and start the process of selling attentively from scratch again, is there one thing you might do differently about the process? If I could, you know, roll back, would have asked for more money, <laughs> probably. From Black as usual. Yeah, absolutely. Did they ask um, you, what do you want for it? Oh yeah. I mean, that's and what did you say? Goes. You know, i uh, not allowed to talk numbers. It's in our, it's in the contract. I'm afraid, but, but yeah, I probably would have pushed for more money and negotiated harder. Um, but you know, we got a good deal, you know, it was crap cash transaction, money changed hands. Yeah. Um, you know, and we cleared all our debts, you know, our investors were taken care of, like, you know, our goals were all met. Um, but also, you know, I might've, we might've sold sooner. Honestly, I mm. think we could have sold sooner had a little less debt, you know, on the books and, and therefore would have recouped even more money for ourselves. Were you able to get to that two to one ROI for like, I mean, you mentioned you were hoping to get two to five times their investment or whatever. Did you, did you reach that threshold? Uh, again, not allowed to talk numbers, okay. uh, but what I, but what I will tell you is, you know, and I have a book called mechanical bowl. I How want you to talk achieve about, startup yeah. success, um, you know, and there is a chapter on acquisition, you know, uh, you know, and, and like, you know, are you ready to sell? And then what happens after that? And what I usually tell people is that there are four types of acquisitions. There's aqua hire, ac hire, you know, where not a lot of money, but you, you get a, a new cool job, you know, with a, a fancy title and maybe some of your debts cleared. And basically that's about preserving your dignity. And hey, there is no price on dignity. It's priceless. And then from there, there's, you know, new car, new house, don't have to work again for the rest of your life. And I would say if I weren't in the Bay Area, 
uh, you know, we, we were probably somewhere in terms of what, you know, each of the founders took away, probably somewhere between new car, new house. So, you know, and, and I think a lot of people think like, you know, you're going to sell for a gazillion dollars. And sometimes that does happen, but that's actually a minority of exits. You know, most exits are in kind of that new car, you know, at hire, you know, through new house range, which is a success. You have built wealth that you didn't have before. You have some security. You also have an incredible success story. If you're going inside the company, you have a new fancy job title and a corner office and maybe stock options. Like, baby, you have one. Okay. It's all good. Love that. I've never heard that before, but I'm going to steal that. Dignity, in other words, aqua hire, car, house, never work again. Great sort of way to segment it up. You mentioned that you'd wished if you could replay the, the clock, or so to speak, that you would have asked for more. I, we, obviously, we don't and can't talk about the actual number, but I'd be curious to know, they asked you, what do you want for attentively? Did you respond with a number, a range, or demur completely and say, well, that's not our job. You tell me what you think it's worth kind of thing. Like, How did you respond to that query? Well, we actually had gone through two rounds, you know, if I'm just being completely frank. So we had, you know, in our first round in talking to people, uh, we had tossed out a number. People didn't like that number. So then we lowered the number. We're on sale. So at that new number, you know, that was where we kind of talked. And then, yeah, it got to the point where they were like, okay, you know, what's the number? We gave them a number and they said, okay. How about this number, which was lower, and that we ended up being about in between that number. So, yeah, it's like weirdly more straightforward than, you know, I imagined like, you know, that cloud of numbers and equations and then they're like, here's the number. It, it actually was a very weirdly straightforward conversation at the very, very end. Got it. So you you sort of almost put a price on your business when you went out to the marketplace, you said, this is the number. That that we did, you didn't get a lot of take at that, so you went at, at a lower number. They came in, uh, and you kind of at a lower number still, but then you kind of met in the middle. Again, if we leave the number itself out of it, can you share like how big a gap it was between on a, maybe on a percentage basis between the number you kind of the second number you put out and and then the number they came in was it like 10% difference like 100 like 50% you did, you know, percentage basis it was a rough yeah you know and again i think a lot of the companies were thinking like what would it what would it cost us to build it you know mm. versus buy it you know and sort of making that calculation in their head which you know again we, we were new at the selling our business game. So, you know, we didn't know that. We just knew like a number that we wanted that would that would be cool for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would say it was maybe 25 to 30%, you know, lower, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. turned out to be kind of the, the magic number. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense for sure. Um, did you did you buy yourself a trophy? Did you buy yourself the house or the car or the like? I asked this question uh, because I think it's really important that as entrepreneurs we we do have some physical uh, you know display of this achievement. I interviewed a woman uh, last week who who always wanted a Rolex watch for some reason, and she decided that this was going to be the time where she bought a watch. And so now every day she kind of looks at her watch and she's sort of reminded of this incredible achievement. Did you buy yourself any sort of trophy, anything that, uh, that you use to kind of commemorate the achievement? Well, you know, they have these deal memos, uh, mementos that are like a little like glass, you know, thing, you know? Right. And so I got that, you know, and, and weirdly like that, you know, having seen that in other people's offices, that's kind of a thing here in Silicon Valley. Yeah, like a tombstone. Like, I think they yeah, refer to it yeah, as a tombstone. Like that yeah, that was kind of like, oh, you know, that's cool. Um, you know, so we, you know, we got sent those. And yeah, I, you know, well, here's what was happening. You know, tw July 2016, uh, we we signed the, the papers, you know, um, for selling the business. August 2016, my son, Colm, was born. Ah, and okay. I like to joke that he's my new startup. <laughs> uh, it's got about an 18 to 20 year runway, 
not really sure what my exit strategy is. You know, let me know anybody if you've got one. Uh, so, um, you know, I, let's just say I brought some dope ass baby gear. Okay. <laughs> got it. Okay. So tombstone and the, and the dope ass baby gear. Love it. Okay. That's great. So, uh, tell us, I love the name of your book, Mechanical Bull. And I incorrectly, when we were talking about it offline, said, oh, it's because like the startup ride is, is, can be very difficult, violent at times. And you said, yes, and tell me about the background of the name. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's a wild ride. You know, that's why I named it Mechanical Bull. And I've actually physically, and, and you know, both my business partner, I've physically been on Mechanical Bulls. And I've never had the courage. About. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's so, it's such a crazy, it's bigger. Like when you get on it, it's like so much bigger and heavier and experience, which in a way is a nice metaphor for having a startup. Um, but also, you know, if you've ever been in a room, you know, where people, you know, there's a mechanical bull, it's usually in a bar, you know, atmosphere, you know, or, or party, something like that. You know, when a man rides, you know, yeah, it's tough, you know, and people are looking for, you know, looking at, you know, his strength, his stamina, like, does he have any kind of strategy involved? Like, very different when a woman gets on board she has to do all of that too, right? In order to stay on. But what people are actually checking out are all the jiggly bits, okay? And just like, is is a titty going to pop out at any moment? Is that going to happen? And then how are we all going to feel about it? You know, so it really is, I mean, you know, that's a very simplistic, you know, <laughs> metaphor, but it is true that like, it's a very different experience, you know, being a female entrepreneur. And yeah, I don't mean to diminish and you know, and I'm sorry if it, it sounds that way and I'm going to work on that. I don't mean to diminish, you know, anyone else's experience because I know it's hard. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for guys to stay on a mechanical bull. They get knocked off pretty quickly. They get knocked too. up. I get, I would last yeah. about five seconds. <laughs> but yeah, the, bru you know, the bruises are real, you know, on everyone. But, you know, it really, it, there's just like an extra layer of, you know, crazy nonsense challenge you know, that I think, you know, because men don't go through it, you know, or white people don't go through it, it's hard for them to imagine that, like, even something that was super challenging for them is like, like, literally, you know, and the numbers are there to prove it literally five to 10 X harder. It's called Mechanical Bull. It's got a wonderful cover. You won't miss it if you Google it or put it on Amazon or <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, Cheryl's holding it up, which is awesome. Um, and the company is called Do Big Things. That's the new company. Uh, just give us a snapshot of what Do Big Things does. Yeah, so Mechanical Bull, you know, it's all about uh, how you can achieve startup success. So that's the tagline. And the reason I wrote it was because uh, I was actually uh, sitting with a friend, you know, not long after the acquisition who said, look, Cheryl, 17 more people have men to the moon than have done what you have done in hmm. America. 17 Americans have been to the moon. One person has done what you have done in your body, right? You have an obligation, you know, to help open the door for others, you know, and, and help, you know, again, democratize access, you know, to, you know, creating, you know, cool ideas, you know, new solutions, you know, and building generational wealth. And so that's why I wrote the book. You know, it really is, you know, goes through the life cycle of a startup, you know, it's partly my journey, but there's also the voices of lots of other founders, lots of investors, you know, who talk about, you know, what they are looking for, you know, or how they can help. Um, so, yeah, I think it's something that anybody can use. Like, you know, you know, the old saying, uh, you know, Grace Kelly said, not Grace Kelly, Ginger Rogers said, you know, I do everything Fred Astaire does, you know, but backwards and in heels, right? So if I can do it, okay, and it was backwards and heels over like a burning, you know, fire. If I can do it, you know, I show you how you can do it too. So then do big things. Yeah, is uh, a new company. It's actually an evolution of, you know, the former um, company. We actually merged with another company, our, our prior digital agency from which attentively sprang. And uh, yeah, you know, it's been great, you know, to, to grow. You know, in these times, you know, Do Big Things uh, focuses on uh, helping the world's leading causes, campaigns, candidates, and corporations with mission-driven initiatives uh, to uh, create change, you know, in this, in this crazy world we're living in today. And, you know, I think that, you know, part of what makes us different is that, 
you know, we are women led. We are 50% people of color. You know, for a lot of our clients, we represent, you know, culturally, you know, the types of people they are looking to engage and, and mobilize, you know, either get out to vote or, you know, educate them on issues and get their support, you know, whether it's in fundraising or, you know, legislation, you know, or just, you know, the day to day, we do a lot of back end support, you know, for folks, um, you know, who, uh, you know, need infrastructural development, you know, in order to then, you know, do that engagement and outreach. So it's been really exciting, you know, we're growing, we're about 35 ish people now, we'll probably be, you know, 50 or more, you know, by the end of, you know, the next election cycle here in the US, which is 2022. Right. And then in my spare time, yeah, in my spare time, uh, I'm also the chief innovation officer at uh, the impact seat. And the impact seat is a venture firm that uh, is looking for and invests in uh, the startups that are creating innovative solutions that solve the problems that the world is facing today. So uh, we do that through, of course, investments, you know, in diverse uh, led startups because diverse companies win. Um, But we also do that through philanthropy and advocacy. And Cheryl, if we have people who wanted to reach out to you directly, is LinkedIn best or what's the best place to kind of connect? LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Uh, I definitely see, uh, you know, everyone's LinkedIn uh, messages, Um, you know, but you can also go to uh, impactseat.com or dobigthings.today or .com for folks for whom .today is hard. (laughs) And the book is called Mechanical Bull. Cheryl Conti, thanks for doing this. Thanks so much, John. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Hey, if you like today's episode, you're going to love my new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. The book was inspired by the cohort of my guests over the years who have been able to negotiate an exit far better than the benchmark in their industry, sometimes two or three times more than I would have expected. I was curious to understand the tactics and strategies of these entrepreneurs and what they do differently from average performers. The result is a playbook for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. To learn more, go to builttosell.com slash selling, where we put together a collection of gifts for listeners who order the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Built to Sell Radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to builttosell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.